even if you're experienced, even if you've been in the FBA space for any amount of time, I guarantee you there's some gems in this presentation that you can pick up. Um, because I mean, I know personally, like I've been selling on Amazon for about six years now, and I've been doing the wholesale business model. I'm in my fifth year of wholesale. And I mean, there's still like, I still learn new, new stuff literally every day. So I think that, I think that you guys will be able to pick something up regardless of your experience level. <clears throat> awesome. So, okay. Small time retail arbitrage, spending every day worried about being banned for authenticity claims. Yep. That's definitely a concern with retail arbitrage. I mean, really that's a concern in any sort of arbitrage business model, but uh, I think you'll find that that is a slightly less of a concern when it comes to wholesale. All right, guys. So it's 7.05 here. We're about five minutes in. We've got about 78 people here. So guys, we're going to go ahead and jump right into the presentation. I'm sure a lot of people will be joining us here a little later. But in the meantime, we will go ahead and get started. So guys, first of all, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Uh, we'll get into my background and who I am, what I do here in a couple of slides. But I wanted to say thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Corey Gannum. This presentation is going to be focused on how I created a fully remote multiple seven figure per year revenue wholesale business on Amazon. And I don't touch my products. I don't see my products. All of my products are handled remotely. Even a lot of our sourcing is handled by employees as well. So I'm going to teach you guys the overview of exactly how I've done that and exactly how you guys can do exactly the same thing. So thank you so much for joining us again, guys. And we will jump right into the presentation. Okay. So <clears throat> like I said, guys, this presentation is going to be an overview, really just a roadmap for a fully remote seven figure wholesale business on Amazon. And so just based on the chat, it sounds like some of you, I saw some retail arbitrage folks, seems like some folks that have tried private label. So I don't think there's many people in the chat here tonight, <clears throat> excuse me, that have tried the wholesale business model. Okay. So that's exciting for me. I love teaching people about it. I love helping people understand it and understand how it works. And so it sounds like there's going to be a lot for you guys to learn tonight. And I'm excited to get into the content here. So let's get right into it. So guys, at the end of the day, wholesale is a business model. It's probably the least popular business model for selling on Amazon, if I had to guess. And the only reason I say that is because you see all this information about private label, right? There's so many private label gurus out there. There's so many private label courses out there. Even on YouTube, there's a lot of free information out there when it comes to private label. There's a lot of information out there when it comes to online arbitrage, when it comes to retail arbitrage. But I really feel like there's a big gap when it comes to the wholesale business model, right? There is some information out there. I mean, myself included, I put a ton of information out there on YouTube, on Twitter, on LinkedIn about the wholesale business model. But at the end of the day, I feel like it is the smallest niche when it comes to selling on Amazon. And really a lot of the people out there that are teaching this wholesale business model, uh, they really try to overcomplicate it, right? And at the end of the day, it's not that complicated. So tonight my goal is to really break it down for you and try to simplify it and put it in a way that is easily understandable, easily digested, even by a newer seller. So guys, this is exactly what we're gonna cover tonight. So the first thing we're gonna cover is how to find suppliers. Okay, so I'm gonna go over a couple of methods that I use to find suppliers for my wholesale business. And really at the end of the day, finding suppliers is the most difficult part of this business. Okay. There are a lot of suppliers out there, but there's only a small percentage of those are actually good suppliers, profitable suppliers that we want to work with in our wholesale business. Okay. So finding suppliers is the hardest part. And that is the first part of the process. And that is what we're going to go over uh, first thing. So the second thing is going to be about how to contact suppliers. Okay. And now you might think that, well, what do you mean? It's, it shouldn't be that complicated, right? Contacting suppliers, all I do is call them or send them an email, right? Well, really that is, that is true. That is correct. But it is a little more nuanced than that. Okay. There's a particular way you want to position yourself when you contact these suppliers. You don't just want to send them a mass email or cold call them and say the wrong thing, right? You want them to take you seriously and you want to come across as a professional that is here to do serious business, okay? So I'm gonna tell you guys exactly how you should be contacting these suppliers, not just you know picking up the phone and, and just haphazardly dialing them or sending them an email. All right, so the third thing that we're gonna go over is how to source products, all right? And so obviously this webinar is hosted by AMZ Scout. Their tool is one of the better tools out there when it comes to actually analyzing products for profitability. So I'm going to give you guys an example of a product that 
uh, that we're going to go over how to analyze that product using AMZ Scout. Okay, it's a fantastic tool. Like I said, thank you to the folks over at AMZ Scout for hosting this webinar. That tool is going to be incorporated into this presentation. And I'm going to show you the exact methods and the exact ways that we go about actually sourcing our products, right? Once we have suppliers to buy from, then we actually have to source the products. <clears throat> so the fourth topic that we're going to cover is all about shipping and logistics. All right, because obviously, as you guys know, when it comes to selling on Amazon, shipping and logistics is a huge part of the business, right? Especially with the wholesale business model, when we're dealing with a lot of different products, sometimes we're dealing with huge volumes of products, right? I mean, there are products that we carry in our business where we're sending in 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 units at a time, right? On multiple pallets. I mean, sometimes full truckloads of product at a time. And that is something that you've got to have your shipping down. You've got to have your logistics down in order to do that in a way that's going to continue to be profitable for you. And so I'm going to show you guys exactly how I have my logistics operation set up, how I fully outsource that operation. Okay. Because like I said, at the beginning of the presentation, I haven't touched a product. I haven't seen a product in about two and a half years. And the reason for that is because of how I've set up my shipping and my logistics. Okay. So I'm going to teach you guys exactly how I do that and exactly how you guys can do exactly the same thing. And then lastly, guys, I'm going to teach you exactly how I use virtual talent to scale. Now, when I say virtual talent, I'm referring to virtual employees, virtual employee, meaning just an employee that I have that is not located near me, right? So my team is actually located in the Philippines. I have two employees in the Philippines and I have one in Nigeria. So that is essentially my virtual team. And while this is not a beginner strategy, right? Leveraging virtual talent to scale is something that you do once you already have momentum, once you're already making profit. But I'm gonna give you guys the principles and the frameworks that I use and that you can use to start scaling with virtual talent once you get to that point, right? So this particular section, like I said, is not necessarily for beginners, but I wanna give you guys the tools so that when you get to that point, you know exactly what to do and you can start to scale with a virtual team. All right, guys, so I'm gonna get into the meat of the presentation here shortly, but first of all, who the heck am I, right? You're probably thinking, you know, most of you probably haven't heard of me. I only started getting active on the social media space really at the beginning of this year. So I'm, so I'm gonna give you guys a quick background on who I am, you know, why you should listen to me, some of my accomplishments so that you can just see what it is that I've done. And so I can prove to you guys why I'm someone worth listening to. All right, so this is me. This is just a, a silly picture of me. This is my LinkedIn profile picture, right? I've just got a big cheesy smile on my face. But guys, my name is Corey Gannam. Again, like I said at the beginning, I'm 28 years old. I live here in Charlotte, North Carolina. I've been selling on Amazon since two days after I graduated from college, which is May of 2017. I pretty much graduated from college and literally two days later started selling on Amazon. I actually opened up my Amazon seller account uh, about a month before I graduated. And before I graduated, I was doing exactly what you guys are doing. I was watching all the YouTube videos. I was attending all the webinars. I was soaking up as much information as I possibly could so that after I graduated a month later, I could set myself up to hit the ground running and start taking action immediately, right? Because I think you guys would agree with me that this information is great. What I'm about to tell you is, is awesome, right? It's good information, but, but it's useless unless you actually act on the information and unless you actually take action at the end of the day. So that is my goal is to arm you guys with information <clears throat> that you can then take action on, all right? So like I said, guys, I've been selling on Amazon for six years since May of 2017. So I'm currently in my seventh year of selling on Amazon. I've been selling on Amazon for the last six years straight, no breaks, no stopping, have grown sales every single year. Uh, and so as far as the wholesale business model, I've been doing wholesale for, I'm actually in my fifth year of wholesale right now. I started the wholesale business model in January of 2019. Okay, so I'm about four and a half years into wholesale, um, coming up, I guess, on my fifth year of wholesale. And so when it comes to the wholesale business model, I've actually sold over $10 million using the wholesale business model in the last four and a half years, right? All brand name products, all sourced from US-based suppliers, nothing purchased from overseas, None of my own brands. I've never created a brand from scratch. I am buying brand name products from US-based suppliers and I'm flipping them on Amazon, okay? To the tune of $10 million over the last four and a half years. And so as far as 
people that I've helped do the exact same thing that I'm doing. So, so far to date, I have 546 successful students that have taken my flagship program called the Wholesale Challenge that have gone on to create successful wholesale businesses of their own. Some of these students I've even worked with, I've even bought deals together with, right? Some of these people I still work with to this day. So to get into the next slide, guys, these are just a couple of screenshots of my sales, a couple of just really some social proof, right, guys? I don't show you this to brag. That's not my intention. I don't care about doing that. My, my goal in showing you this information right here is just to prove to you that I know what I'm talking about and that it's pretty much just backing up what I just said, right? So this top screenshot was the, I was our last year's sales, right? 2022 sales, just under $4.3 million in sales. This screenshot right here, same thing, um, just under 4.3 million in sales last year. And then on the left-hand side of the screen here is just the, is a screenshot of just some of the transactions that have been our disbursements from our Amazon account, right? So we've had multiple six-figure disbursements hit our bank account that have, like I said, have all come from selling brand name products on Amazon that we're buying from US-based suppliers that we're never seeing and that we're never touching. <clears throat> and so guys, again, just to further, I guess, hit home the point that I was making earlier that I have 546 students that to date have seen success with my program, right? They've seen success from the wholesale challenge. These are just testimonials from people that have taken my program. All right, I don't need to dwell on this. Like I said, um, I have plenty of testimonials just like these. And I think you can see right here from, from these screenshots that you know what I teach is legitimate and that it works. Okay, so I saw somebody in the chat a couple of minutes ago say, well, what is wholesale, right? And so that's actually what we're gonna start off with because like I said, I believe that wholesale is probably the least popular business model for selling on Amazon. Why that is, I don't know. I personally think it should be the most popular business model for selling on Amazon. But at the end of the day, I think it's just not talked about nearly as much as it should be. So what the heck is wholesale, right? I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. And that is just the simple act of buying brand name products from US-based distributors or directly from the manufacturer and then turning around and flipping it on Amazon, okay? So I saw some people in the chat that said that they've done retail arbitrage. I'm sure some of you have tried online arbitrage. So wholesale is a very similar, except instead of buying from a Walmart or a Target or another retailer, for example, we are actually buying directly from the source, either directly from the manufacturer that makes the product or from one of the manufacturer's authorized distributors. You see, so that way we're able to buy in much larger quantities. We don't have to worry about our orders getting canceled and we're able to access products at better pricing than we would if we were buying it from a Target or a Walmart, like I said. And so this is a question that I get very frequently. <clears throat> I get this question in Twitter DMs. I get this question as comments on my YouTube videos. And a lot of people wanna know, is wholesale beginner friendly? Okay, and so, my answer to that question is it depends. And that's going to be my answer when it comes to a lot of questions. So it depends on how much capital that you have to start. So I always recommend that if you're looking to get into wholesale, you need at least three to $5,000 in capital for inventory. Okay. And that is a minimum. If you have less than really less than three to $5,000 in capital for inventory, wholesale is not going to be the best route for you. And really, if you have $10,000 or more in capital for inventory, that is gonna be your best bet to start with wholesale, all right? If you have anything less than that, I always recommend people start off with a retail arbitrage or an online arbitrage to build that capital up and then deploy it into a higher leverage business model like wholesale, okay? So that's not to say that you can't start wholesale if you're brand new, you absolutely can, right? You've just gotta have the capital, you've gotta have the foundation to be able to set yourself up for a long-term successful business. All right, so guys, first things first. So this is the first part of the process, right? It all is, it's all about finding suppliers because if you don't have suppliers, you don't have products. And if you don't have products, you can't make sales. And if you don't make sales, you don't have a business, okay? So that's gonna be the first thing that we talk about tonight. And it's all about finding suppliers. So guys, when it comes to the suppliers that are out there, right? There's really two different types at the end of the day. So you have your distributors and you have your brands. Brands can also be, you also might hear me say the word manufacturer. Manufacturer and brand is essentially interchangeable, all right? 
So let me define what the difference is between a brand and a distributor. All right, so a brand, AKA a manufacturer, is exactly that. They are the manufacturer of the product, right? They own the trademark, they own the product, they make the product, they are the brand themselves, right? Now, a distributor is somebody who is authorized by the brand to resell their products to other retailers, all right? So how it might look is a brand is here at the top, they make the product, the brand might sell their products to, let's just say, 10 authorized distributors, right? And those 10 authorized distributors then turn around and distribute that brand's products to all the retailers around the country, like me, like you, like anybody doing wholesale on Amazon, okay? So that is the difference between brands and distributors. Both of them are great. Both of them have their pros and cons. Both of them require a slightly different approach when it comes to working with one or the other, all right? And so to give you guys a background on our business, so currently we work, I'd say about 80% of our products come from distributors and about 20% of our products come directly from the brand, okay? Now, I know that, I know people out there, I know other wholesale sellers that 100% of their products come directly from the brand, right? They only work directly with the brand. And that's fine. That's great. That's their business model. We just happen to have a little more luck working with distributors. And we have a couple of brands that we've had really good relationships with that we work with closely that we buy from directly. Okay. So again, nothing wrong with either or. They're both viable. They both have their pros and cons. <clears throat> okay. So guys, when it comes to finding distributors, right? Now, again, distributors are large companies that are authorized by the manufacturer to distribute their products to other retailers like me, like other people around the country, right? So you might see a lot of information out there on what makes a good distributor, right? How do I know if a distributor is legit? How do I know if it's a good supplier? Well, over my last four and a half years of wholesale, of so many, so much trial and error, I've cold called over 3,000 suppliers in the last four and a half years. I've distilled all of that trial and error down to a very simple three-step checklist, or basically three simple criteria that we now use to determine if a distributor is a legitimate or not, okay? And that is these three that I'm showing you right here. Uh, so the first is... You're just, you want your distributors to be primarily B2B, okay? And when I say B2B, I mean business to business, right? B2B being business to business, B2C being business to consumer. And now the reason you want your distributors to be primarily B2B is these distributors, some of them might sell to consumers, like might sell to the public. And those distributors that also sell to the public typically don't have great pricing, right? So if anybody can just walk up off the street and buy from them, chances are their pricing is going to be a little higher and it's going to be, it's just going to be more saturated, right? Because if there's not that barrier to entry, if anybody can buy from them, they're just not going to be as profitable. All right. So we, the best distributors are primarily business to business. So you've got to have a business license to be able to buy from them. All right. The second criteria is the best distributors will sell to retailers. All right. Now, you might think, well, wouldn't every distributor sell to retailers? Well, that's not necessarily the case. And let me give you an example. So there are distributors out there that we've contacted before and they meet that first criteria, right? They are B2B. They only sell to other businesses and they meet our third criteria. They carry brand name products. However, in just to use an example, they might sell only to schools, hospitals, and the government, right? There's a supplier that sold brand name products. They were B2B. We reached out to them before, but they shut us down. They did not want to sell to us because they were primarily selling to schools and universities, right? So you want to make sure that retailers are at least a typical customer type that these distributors, that they service. Otherwise, you just won't fit their business model. And the chances of you getting an account with that distributor are going to be pretty low. All right. So we want to make sure that our distributors that we're working with sell to retailers like us. The third criteria of the best distributors out there, like I mentioned earlier, they carry brand name products and not just any brand name products, but they carry brand name products that are already selling well on Amazon. Okay. So to give you an example, like there are some distributors out there, they might carry brand name products, but if they're just some no name brands or some startup brands that don't really have any traction or any sales on Amazon, 
then there's really no reason for us to work with them, right? Because that is our business model. We're buying products and we're selling products on Amazon that are already selling well. We're not creating our own brands from scratch. We're not running ads. We're not doing anything to generate demand because the demand is already built in because those products are already selling, right? So that is why we want distributors that carry brand name products that are already selling well on Amazon. <clears throat> okay, and so again, guys, just to summarize, the best distributors out there, they're gonna be primarily business to business. They are going to sell primarily to retailers and they are going to carry brand name products that are already selling well on Amazon. Okay, now guys, you know how I mentioned the other type of supplier out there is the brand themselves or the manufacturer. Those two terms are interchangeable. And guys, there's really just two criteria that we look for when it comes to brands that we would want to work with for selling on Amazon, right? So we wanna make sure that they're already selling well. Like I said, that they have at least one or two products that if we were to look those products up on Amazon, there's existing demand, right? People are buying them. They have good reviews. They're moving, like they're selling on a regular basis. You see what I mean? So that's really the most important thing is that built-in demand has to already be there. The second thing we want to confirm is that these brands have existing FBA competition on their listings. Now, you might be thinking, wait a second, why would we want existing competition? That doesn't make sense. I don't want competition. And you'd be right. However, the reason we look for existing FBA competition is because if a brand has existing FBA sellers selling their products, well, then that means that those sellers are getting those products profitably from somewhere. So that means that we can probably do the same. You see what I mean? So in this case, competition is a good thing because it means somebody somewhere is getting those products at a profitable price. That means we can probably do the same. All right, so the best brands already have built-in demand on Amazon and they already have people that are selling their products. Now, you don't want you know, 50, 100 people selling their products, but you know if there's three, five, 10, even 15 different sellers, depending on how big the brand is, selling that brand's products already, then that's a good sign, not necessarily a bad sign. And guys, so I, I do see some questions here coming in the chat and I'm gonna hold some of these questions here. I'm gonna try to batch them together. So I'm gonna get through a couple of sections at a time and then I'm gonna address some questions kind of as we go along. So guys, put your questions in the chat and I'm gonna address a bunch of them kind of at once. So bear with me and I'm gonna get some of those answered here shortly. Okay, guys, so when it comes to finding distributors, I promised you guys I would tell you how to find distributors, and this is exactly that. So when it comes to finding distributors, Google is going to be the best method by far. And that might sound like a cop-out, right? It's like, well, obviously, I can just Google distributors, but it goes a little further than that. I'm going to show you guys a trick that we use with a tool called SpyFu to generate additional leads from existing suppliers, okay? So you're going to use Google to search for distributors in your area. And like I said, you wanna run them through those three criteria that I mentioned earlier, right? So let's say you find a distributor that meets those three criteria. They sell to retailers, they're primarily B2B and they carry brand name products that are already selling well on Amazon. Then what you wanna do is you wanna take the URL of that distributor's website and there's a tool called SpyFu. It's literally called, it's spyfu.com. You will enter that distributor's website into SpyFu and guys, I'm going to even share my screen and show you an example of exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm going to show you guys SpyFu. And guys, I am going to just pick a random website here just to use as an example. So I'm just going to say, uh, let's just say Amazon.com. All right. So again, pre pretend that this Amazon.com, pretend this is your distributor's URL. Okay. So you're going to put your distributor's website into the search bar here. And then what you're going to do is you're going to scroll down here to competition. And you're going to see these organic competitors. OK, so when you enter a distributor's website into this search bar right here, a lot of times, guys, these organic competitors that show up right here, one, two, three, four and five are going to be other distributors just like the one you entered. OK, so obviously we're using Amazon as an example. That's these are not going to be other distributors. But let's just say that one of these five results might be another legitimate distributor, just like the one you entered then you can see how SpyFu is a way to generate additional supplier leads from the leads that you already have. Okay, so every time you find a, a qualified distributor 
you want to run them through SpyFu and see if you can develop a, a couple of additional leads out of that lead, okay? Because guys, not every time, not all five of these leads are going to be additional distributors. Sometimes none of them are, but sometimes all five of them are, okay. all right? And guys, the other thing to keep in mind is that when it comes to your distributors, you want to start local, okay? So like I said, I'm here in Charlotte, North Carolina. So when I'm looking for suppliers, I like to look for suppliers near me, all right? And then once I've exhausted all of the suppliers in my area, which is next to impossible, right? There's gonna be plenty of suppliers around me, but let's just say I did, then I wanna to start to expand out from there, okay? Then I wanna look regional, then I wanna look possibly nationally from there, okay? All right, yeah, so guys, thank you. Uh, so, and guys, give me feedback in the chat, okay? So I see some comments there. It sounds like that spy food tip was helpful. That is like one of my, one of my favorite tips of all time. And so that's not a tip I gatekeep. Like I literally have a YouTube video about how to do that, right? That's just information that I give out for free all the time. So I'm glad that tip was helpful because I mean, I found, I think I've found all of my best suppliers using that method. So I'm glad that that, that was helpful. And guys, we're, we've got a lot of good, more good information here in this presentation. So stick with me and I'm gonna show you some more, uh, some more tips just like that. Okay. Now guys, when it comes to finding brands, right? So keep in mind that the brand is the manufacturer of the product themselves, all right? So when it comes to finding brands, the best method to find brands is going to be from reverse sourcing on Amazon, right? And now I'm not gonna share my screen and go through this method only because this particular method can sometimes take a good amount of time, right? So when it comes to reverse sourcing brands on Amazon, what you wanna do is you just wanna pick a category. And I always recommend you pick a category that you know, okay? So let's just say that you're picking, let's just say you choose pet supplies, right? So you're gonna go on Amazon, you're gonna go into pet supplies, and then you're gonna pick a subcategory within pet supplies, all right? And so on the left-hand side of the screen, you're able to filter by price point. So I personally like to find higher price products only because they typically have less competition. So I might, sh I might filter Amazon to show me products between, let's just say $20 and $50, right? And then as I make that filter, then Amazon is gonna give me obviously a ton of results and probably hundreds of pages of, of products to go through, all right? And so when Amazon gives me those, that, those search results pages, I'm gonna be looking for products where, like I said, we wanna see existing FBA competition, right? because that means that somebody somewhere is buying those products at a profitable price, which means that we can probably do the same. Okay, so I'm looking for a good rule of thumb is you wanna see at least three FBA sellers on a listing. And the reason I use the number three is because if there's only one FBA seller on the listing, then chances are it's a private label product. And obviously private label sellers are not looking to have other sellers on their listing, all right? And then even if there's two FBA sellers, that could also still be a private label seller that just has two accounts. So we found in our experience, the best number of sellers to really keep an eye out for it. We wanna see three FBA sellers, right? <clears throat> and the only other thing that we're looking for is we just wanna make sure that those listings are not dominated by Amazon, okay? So if Amazon is on the listing, if Amazon is always in the buy box, then we're not gonna be able to compete, right? So we wanna see at least three FBA sellers and we wanna make sure that Amazon is not dominating that listing. If it meets those two criteria, then that's a brand that we might wanna reach out to. Okay, and guys, here's a bonus method for finding suppliers, and this is how we found some of our better suppliers as well, okay? And it comes down to analyzing trade show lists. And so for those of you that don't know what a trade show is, so a trade show is basically a big event that a lot of suppliers, a lot of brands, a lot of distributors from a given category, they come together. It's basically a conference, right? They set up booths, they show their products to potential buyers, and they just network. All right. So trade shows can be a really good opportunity to, if you're going to go in person, can be a fantastic opportunity to meet some of these suppliers in person, open accounts, place orders there at the trade show. And that's actually something that I will be doing uh, at a trade show coming up on August 20th. So in about two weeks, there's a trade show happening in Las Vegas. It's called ASD Market Week. It's happening, I believe it's from August 20th through the 23rd. It's one of the biggest trade shows in the country. I went, when they had it in March, I went in March and I'm going again in two weeks. So it's a fantastic trade show. 
But guys, you don't even need to go to the trade show to find qualified supplier leads from that trade show. And so let me explain. So a lot of trade shows, ASD being one of them, they will have a website, right? So I think ASD's website is like asdmarketweek.com. And on these trade show websites, almost all of them will have a, they'll have a section on their website that says like exhibitors or like attendees, right? They'll have, a, basically they will have a list of every company that is paying to set up a booth at the trade show. Okay. And so that's really important information because if a company is paying to set up a booth at ASD, for example, like they're there looking for buyers, right? They're there looking to sell their products. And we are obviously looking to buy products. So what you can do is you can literally go to ASD's website right now or after this webinar, and you can look at the attend or the exhibitors list. And there's, there'll be a list of hundreds. I mean, ASD is massive. I think there's over a thousand suppliers that attend ASD. And you can basically go through that list, supplier by supplier, and filter them through those criteria that I mentioned earlier, right? If they're a distributor, you filter them through the three distributor criteria. If they're a brand, you filter them through the two brand criteria. And so that way you can have a list of, let's say, a thousand suppliers and filter it down to maybe, you know, 60, 70, 100 suppliers that meet your criteria that you can then contact without even having to go to the trade show. All right. So that's a way where you can, like I said, find literally a hundred possible leads just from your computer, just from looking at that one trade show list. And there are hundreds, if not thousands of trade shows taking place every year in the US, in the UK, in South America, everywhere. All right. So you guys can see how really the opportunity for finding profitable suppliers is only limited by your imagination. There is so much opportunity out there to work with so many different kinds of suppliers. It just comes down to looking for them running them through the criteria, and then doing the work to contact them and start working with them. And so guys, I see some more questions coming in. Like I said earlier, I'm going to try to address those all at once. So put those in the chat if you have questions. And I'm going to pause here in about 10 minutes or so, and we're going to knock out a couple of the questions, and then we'll keep going. <clears throat> all right, so guys, when, it, when you find a lead, right? So let's say you're going through that trade show list and let's say you find a supplier that looks promising. Well, what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna want to take their contact information, put it into a Google Sheet or a CRM. You don't need a CRM. Uh, we just use a simple old Google Sheet that works just fine. And guys, a CRM, for those of you that don't know, it is, stands for a customer relationship management software. It's basically a way for you to organize and track all of your leads, okay? But it's not necessary. A Google Sheet will work just fine. All, all you have to do is call them or email them, asking them to open a wholesale account, right? Telling them that you are a retail business, you're an e-commerce retailer, which is true. That's exactly what you are. And you're looking to buy from them at wholesale. And then guys, my suggestion, just for efficiency's sake, is I like to find 20 leads and then contact 20 leads and then find 20 leads and then contact 20 leads. It's just way cleaner than you know finding one and then contacting one, right? It allows you to kind of batch your efforts into... Like I can be in finding mode and then I can be in contacting mode. That's just the, how I work. Some of you might be different, but in my opinion, that's the most efficient way to go about it. Yeah, somebody said ASD website is gold. I'm telling you, I, I mean, we found, so I went, like I said, I went to ASD last March. We, we kind of combed the website before we went. We made a short list before we went so that when I got to ASD, I knew exactly who I wanted to talk to. And I talked to, I probably talked to like 50 or 60 different companies at ASD. We ended up buying from, I think, three or four of them. One of those suppliers in particular, we've spent like $150,000 with in the last three months. And that's just one supplier that I met one time at ASD, right? So there's just obviously so much opportunity there. All right, guys. So the second pillar of a wholesale business comes down to contacting suppliers. And like I said earlier, it's not as simple as just sending them a, a blanket email or giving them a cold call, right? There's a special way that you want to go about doing that, okay? It's, and it, there's a way you want to position yourself when contacting these suppliers. So guys, the biggest mistake that I see when people are reaching out to suppliers, whether they're reaching out to brands or whether they're reaching out to distributors, is they call themselves an Amazon seller, Right. Those two words, I want you to erase them from your vocabulary, all right? You are not an Amazon seller if you're in the wholesale business. You are an e-commerce retailer 
that has an online sales channel on the biggest retail marketplace in the world. You see how that's a little more convincing, a little more professional than just saying, hey, I'm an Amazon seller, right? Because when you say, hey, I'm an Amazon seller, the supplier's brain immediately, they turn it off, right? Because they've heard that so many times, they've dealt with so many unprofessional Amazon sellers that when you call yourself one of those, you could be the nicest person in the world, you could be the most professional person in the world, but the second you call yourself an Amazon seller, they are not listening to you, all right? It's all about positioning and that is how you get the best accounts and that is how you increase your conversion rate to get more accounts. And like I said, guys, suppliers avoid Amazon sellers like the plague. They do. It's because there's so many of them out there that are unprofessional. They're small time. They place really small orders. They don't communicate, right? There's just a really negative stigma around Amazon sellers that we want to avoid by coming off as professional, positioning ourselves, like I said, as an e-commerce business owner with a large retail sales channel on the world's biggest retail marketplace, aka Amazon. Right. So there's a big difference between calling yourself an Amazon seller and saying what I just said right there. So Jamie said pulling info from LinkedIn and adding personalization has been key. Oh, 100 percent. So I love LinkedIn. All right. I'm a huge fan of LinkedIn. Recently, I've gotten very active on the platform. Jamie, LinkedIn has been my number one way to increase my conversion rates. Right. So I could send a cold email to a company and it may or may not even get seen. They might not even get it much less answer it, right? But if I can find a sales rep at that company on LinkedIn and send them a direct message on LinkedIn, I have like a 50-50 shot at that point, right? Which is way higher than I'm gonna have if I'm just sending a generic email to like info at distributor.com or like sales at distributor.com, you see what I mean? So LinkedIn is massively, massively underrated for finding really good suppliers and getting in touch with specific people at those suppliers. So Jamie, good for you. You're doing exactly the right thing. <clears throat> and so guys, really the biggest issue that beginners face is they're just not even getting responses from suppliers. So I can't tell you how many people DM me on Twitter, they comment on my YouTube videos and they say, hey, I've reached out to you know X amount of suppliers or you know, I've called X amount of suppliers and they're not even responding, right? I don't even have my opportunity to pitch them because they're not even answering me. And there could be a couple of reasons for that. One of the reasons is if you're using just a generic like Gmail email address or like a Yahoo email address, that is a big red flag to a supplier. One, they might think that you are like a scammer, right? If you don't have a professional domain email address, then if they see a, an email coming in from a Gmail, that, that one, that might go to spam. Two, they might think that you're not a legitimate business, right? So you want to have a professional email address from a domain. You want to be coming across as a professional, okay? That is key. It's all about positioning. So guys, when it comes to the solution for not getting responses, right? It's all about the follow-up. And now let me tell you guys a quick story about how we landed our number one account currently. It is currently our most profitable account by far. We have spent, there have been purchase orders that I've placed with this particular supplier. I mean, we've spent $110,000 in one order with this one supplier. And the reason that we got this supplier was from just persistent, just refusing to give up follow-up, okay? Over the course of three and a half years, it took us three and a half years of follow-up to land this account, all right? And some people aren't even following up three times, much less for three and a half years. All right, so I reached out to this account when I first started in Amazon Wholesale. This is one of the first brands I ever contacted in 2019, okay? So I called them up, they shut me down. They said, hey, we're not opening new accounts right now. I said, okay, do you mind if I follow up once a quarter? They said, sure. So I ended up following up with them once a quarter, every quarter for three and a half years. And we finally, 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 three and a half years later, got the opportunity. We didn't just get the account. We got the opportunity to pitch for the account. You see what I mean? So three and a half years later, they gave us the opportunity to submit a proposal to become an authorized reseller. We submitted a proposal and luckily we were chosen. But guys, that took three and a half years of follow-up, of rapport building, of checking in, of providing value, of you know seeing how they're doing, right? Not taking no for an answer.
So that is the key at the end of the day, guys. It is all about follow-up. And so guys, when it comes to contacting your suppliers, there's going to be some really important things that you want to ask them. So when you do get the account, you want to ask, what are the lead times, right? Lead time means how long does it take for a product to get from the supplier to me, right? So if I place an order today, how long is it going to take for me to get that product? That's what the lead time is. And that's a really important thing to know because some suppliers might have, they might only have a three or four day lead time, but some suppliers might have a three or four week lead time. Some might even have three or four month lead time. Okay. So that's a very important thing to know. Something you want to ask your suppliers as soon as you open that relationship. All right. And so second thing you want to ask is you want to ask about MOQs, <clears throat> which stands for minimum order quantity. Okay. So a minimum order quantity is basically just the minimum, or, the minimum order that you have to place to be able to work with that supplier. Right. So some suppliers will have a very high minimum. They might have a, a $1,000, $2,000, $5,000, $10,000 MOQ. Some suppliers might not have any MOQ. Right. And some suppliers might be in between. So you want to ask, do they have a minimum amount that you have to spend in order to work with them? And then a third thing that I like to ask as well is, do you offer free shipping? OK, some suppliers will offer free shipping. Some suppliers will not ever offer free shipping. And some suppliers will offer free shipping at a certain threshold. All right. So they might say, yeah, we'll offer We'll give you free shipping if you spend five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars. OK, so these are questions that I like to ask suppliers to make sure that I know what I'm getting into, to make sure that I know I'm going to be able to work with them effectively. All right. So, guys, we're about 45 minutes in. We're going to be talking about sourcing products next. But I want to pause really quick. There have been some really good questions that have been asked. And I want to take a second and answer some of those, okay? So we've got quite a few and I'm just gonna start from the top and we're gonna touch on a couple of them and then we're gonna keep going. So somebody said, some suppliers ask for a website. How can we set up a website other than to convince the supplier that you mean business? So I assume you're just saying like, how can you set up a website to prove to a supplier that you're legitimate? So really at the end of the day, there's two different kinds of websites that you can have. The first type of website that you could have is like an informational website, right? This website, you're not selling anything on the website. It is not a, you know, there's not a shopping cart on the website. It's just saying like, this is my company. This is what we do. This is who we work with. Okay. So a website like that, that's purely informational can go really far in establishing credibility and showing your suppliers that like they, they'll know who you are based on that website, right? So the other kind of website that you can have is like a storefront website, right? Basically like a Shopify type website where customers can go on your website, they can buy products and suppliers can see that website and see it as another sales channel of yours, right? So we do a lot in the tool and automotive niche. So we have a website dedicated to tool and automotive products where we make sales on a regular basis. If we're reaching out to a supplier in that niche, we can show them, hey, here is our website where we sell tools and automotive products, and we also sell those products on Amazon. You see what I mean? So those are the two different kinds of websites that you can have if you are approaching suppliers. So Jamie said, I wonder if it can disrupt credibility if you ask for the, the MOQ, if you ask for the minimum order quantity. So Jamie, that's actually a good observation, but it's actually not, that will not hurt your credibility. If anything, that will help your credibility because one, if you mention the term MOQ, that's like an industry term, right? That proves that you know what, like, what you're talking about. You've been around the block. And if anything, it's proving to them that like you want to know how, how best to work with them. So by you asking what their MOQ is, they're going to tell you. And so that way, you know if it's going to be a good fit, right? Because the worst thing that you can do is to get down the path of the supplier, come to find out they've got a 20K MOQ, for example. And then you just wasted a lot of your time, maybe looking through some products when you're not going to be able to meet that minimum. So if anything, that helps your credibility. All right. Somebody asked, is it better to buy more products or less? So, I mean, there's, there's two answers to that. Really, our business is all about what you can buy. So the more you can buy, the more you're going to be able to sell, which means the more money you can make. Obviously, you only want to be buying products that are profitable that you can sell. Okay. So... When it comes to like, should you buy more or should you buy less? It depends on how much capital you have and how many profitable products you have access to. 
if you're just swimming in profitable products, then buy everything you can, right? Stretch your capital out as far as you can and buy as many different good profitable products as you can. If they only have a couple of good products or even no good products, then, you know, I probably I would probably not buy anything. Right. You don't want to you don't want to waste your money on products that aren't going to make you a return or that aren't you're not going to be able to sell quickly. Uh, Raul said, should we ask for a sample? So, Raul, that samples are not really commonplace when in the wholesale business model. When it comes to private label, samples are very common. You definitely want to get a sample if you're doing private label. But when it comes to wholesale, since we're just buying existing brand name products that are already selling well, we should know what the products are. We know the products are selling well. As long as we're buying from a legitimate supplier, which you should be, then you won't need a sample. And it's not very commonplace to ask for a sample. So Corey Smith said, how do you get approval from the brands if you get the products through distributors? So you don't necessarily need approval from a brand to sell their product on Amazon. If you're gated in the brand on Amazon, then you can use the, the invoice from the distributor to get ungated, right? That invoice will get you ungated. You don't need a written permission from a brand to sell their products on Amazon. All right, so Jamie said, do you manually track follow-up in an Excel or do you drop this prospect in a sequence and automate it? So Jamie, we use a Google Sheet, basically Excel, right? There are CRM programs out there that will automate follow-up. They will send automated, you know, based on a certain amount of time that passes, for example, they might send an automated follow-up to a supplier. But in our business, we like to keep things personalized. We like to have that human touch. So we just will follow up uh, either myself or my one of my employees will do the follow-up. Somebody asked, is there a cost to use SpyFu? So in that example earlier that I showed SpyFu, no. So SpyFu is completely free. That tool is 100% free. Uh, Jamie also asked, how often do you get declined from a trade show being an Amazon seller? I, th I assume you're talking about like a vendor at a trade show. Do they work with Amazon sellers? How often do I get declined? So really it depends, right? And it also depends, like I said earlier, on how you're positioning yourself. So if I'm positioning myself as an e-commerce retailer that sells on our website, also sells on Amazon, but has, you know we've been around the block, we're experienced, we know what we're doing, then typically we don't get declined that often. I mean, don't get me wrong, we still do. But if we position ourselves properly and if we come across professionally, we're going to get declined a lot less often. Uh, Trung said, will you be bringing students with you to ASD? So no, I won't be. Um, I will be meeting people at ASD for sure. I mean, if, if people go to ASD, I'll be meeting everybody there that wants to meet. But I will be attending with the intention of growing my business, right? So I'm going to be there talking to suppliers and networking with other sellers as well. All right. So somebody said, I have $1,000 for product. Should I find one that is really good and buy all of that product or split it into a few different products? And how do I know if it's a great product? So this is my first piece of advice. So if you only have $1,000, I would not get into wholesale. Okay, so like I said earlier, wholesale is ideal. You need at least three to $5,000 in capital to start wholesale, okay? If you only have $1,000, I highly, highly recommend you start with either retail arbitrage or online arbitrage to build your capital up to when you have three to 5,000 and then from there transition into wholesale, okay? $1,000 just isn't quite enough money to really effectively get started in wholesale. All right, guys, so those are some good questions. Um, keep them coming there in the chat. We're gonna get back into the presentation and we'll answer questions here in a little bit. I did see somebody ask, can this work internationally? So absolutely. So a lot of my students are international. I, I happen to know somebody that's based in New Zealand that he's selling on Amazon US. He's buying from US-based suppliers. He's working with US-based prep centers, which we'll get into here in a little bit, to prep all of his products for him. And he is selling a lot. He, I think he's a seven-figure seller now in Amazon US. And like I said, he is based in New Zealand. So this is a perfectly viable method for international sellers. There's just gonna be a few more hoops to jump through that folks that are based in the US would not necessarily need to jump through. All right, so let's keep going here and we'll talk about sourcing products. 
So guys, the first thing that you do, once you have the wholesale account open, right? So we talked about how to find suppliers. We talked about how to contact suppliers and how to position yourself in the best possible manner to get wholesale accounts, right? So what do you do when you have an account open? You start looking for products, all right? And that can come in a couple of different forms. So when you actually open accounts, sometimes your supplier will have a price list or like a price sheet that they will email you right? And so you can basically look at that price list and then compare it to the pricing on Amazon. And that's going to be manual. That's going to be tedious, but we're going to get into that method here shortly. Sometimes your supplier will have like a web portal. For example, they might have a website that has all their products, and all their pricing on it. And in that case, manual sourcing is going to be the best option as well, which we, like I said, we will get into here in another slide uh, in a second. So guys, this first point here is basically what I just mentioned, right? So your supplier is either going to have a catalog or a website that you can evaluate for profitability, or if they don't have that, which a lot of suppliers won't, a lot of suppliers will say, Hey, these are the brands that we work with. What are you looking for? Right? So in that scenario, when your supplier asks you what you're looking for, you want to know what brands they carry, which you can ask them and they will tell you. And then it's on you to go on Amazon and find out which products from those brands are already selling well, like we said earlier. So you want to look for brands that meet those two brand criteria, and you want to put together a short list of products from those brands. And you want to bring that short list of products to your supplier and ask for a quote. Okay, so let's just say, for example, that you open an account with a supplier and that supplier says, hey, we carry Kraft, General Mills and Procter and Gamble, for example. But they don't have like a price list and they don't have a website with all their products, but you know that they carry those brands. So then what you wanna do is you wanna go look on Amazon for a couple of products from those brands that are selling well, that have existing FBA competition and that aren't dominated by Amazon, all right? So that can be three or four products, that might be hundreds of products, but really you wanna start with like five to 10 products that meet those criteria put them on a list, like a spreadsheet basically, and then bring that list back to your supplier and say, hey, I did some research. These are some products that I found that look to be pretty good. They look to be selling well. Can you give me a quote on these products, right? So then your supplier can then give you a quote on the specific products. And then once you have that price, then you can determine if it's gonna be profitable to buy those products to sell them on Amazon. All right, so there's basically those two methods. Either your supplier already has products and pricing, or you've got to find the products and your supplier is going to give you the pricing. All right, so guys, I'm going to give you a quick detailed rundown on how we use AMZ Scout to quickly analyze a product for profitability, okay? So if you're a beginner, this might be a little bit over your head. This is going to be a quick and dirty product analysis example that I'm going to show you using AMZ Scout, all right? So... This particular product right here, this Gillette, it's an eight blade refill, right? It is a product that we carry in our business. We're currently selling this product and we sell a lot of this product. We currently sell it for about $27.60. Okay, so when you have the AMZ Scout Chrome extension, which is a fantastic tool that you can use to analyze for profitability, this little pop-up is gonna show down here at the left, all right? This AMZ Scout Pro. So we're gonna click on that. That is going to open up this menu here. Oops, sorry guys. All right, so that's gonna open up this menu here and this is what the Chrome extension does. And so the product that we're looking at here is gonna be the first one here on our list. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on that profit calculator. All right, so let me see if I can expand this here, guys. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna click on this profit calculator and this is going to pull up the profitability metrics of this product, okay? So you guys can see where this is telling us a lot of information. So I don't want to overwhelm you guys, but there's a couple of key things that I want us to pay attention to here. So the first thing is our fulfillment fee. So this is how much Amazon is going to charge us to fulfill this product. Next is the referral fee. So this is how much Amazon is going to charge us to uh, basically is going to charge us for selling the product on their platform. Right. And this is telling us that this particular listing is selling almost 6,300 units per month. So what we're going to do now is we're going to come up here and we're going to put in our buy cost. So we buy this product for $17.50 from our supplier. All right, so we're going to put in 1750. 
And now we're going to see how the, the profitability has changed down here. So now we're going to take a look at some of the profitability. So since we pay $17.50, now that is our all-in cost. That includes everything, all right? We are left with $2.09 in profit per unit with, for a margin of just over 7.5% and an ROI of close to 12%. OK, now you might be thinking, well, that's a really low margin, right? That's also a really low ROI. But you got to keep in mind, this listing is selling almost 6,300 units per month. All right. Now, that's total across all sellers. All right. So we are not going to be getting all 6,300 of those sales per month. But since, like I said, we have sold this product before, so I know exactly how many we sell per month. We sell around, I believe it's around 900 of these per month. So let's do some quick math here. So if we're making $2.09 per unit and we're selling 900 units per month, then we're going to be bringing in around $1,881 in gross profit per month off this one product, right? So this is kind of how we make our sourcing decisions. I want to see how much gross profit can I expect to make per month. And I like to sell products where I'm going to make at least a $250 gross profit per month. Right. And this is obviously well in excess of that two hundred and fifty dollars. So because of that, this product is a winner to me. Right. I'm making two dollars per unit. I'm selling nine hundred per month. That is a good product that does a lot of volume, even though it's a little lower margin. We make up for it in volume. All right, guys. So let's keep going here. I hope that was a good example. Uh, we're going to keep on rolling. So a very common question that I get, guys, is how much inventory should you buy? Okay, some people buy too little, some people buy too much. Well, for my business personally, we like to buy anywhere from 30 to 45 days worth of inventory at a time. Now, the reason for that, the reason we don't just want to buy, you know, 60 or 90 days worth of inventory is because we're competing with other sellers, right? It's a free market. So there's other people jumping on and off the listings all the time. So because of that, we don't want to go too deep and then somehow the price tanks or a bunch of sellers jump on the listing right? And then we're left with a lot of unprofitable product. So we want to buy anywhere from a month to a month and a half worth of inventory at a time. That's to limit our downside, but also to have enough inventory on hand to be making constant sales. Okay. So we shoot for 30 to 45 days worth of inventory. Now, guys, this is something that I preach often, 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 especially to newer sellers. Okay. So Whenever you are in doubt about whether or not a product is going to be good or whether it's going to be profitable, maybe it's kind of borderline and you're not exactly sure if it's going to be a good buy. My advice is to always, always, always place a test order. Okay. And so what a test order looks like in my mind is about two weeks worth of inventory. <clears throat> okay. So if AMZ Scout is telling you, um, you know, however many monthly sales AMZ Scout is telling you a product is doing, you want to buy about two weeks worth of those sales. You see what I mean? Because that way, if the product ends up not being as profitable as you thought, well, it's only two weeks worth. You'll be sold out in two weeks. It's not a big deal, right? And that way, if it is very profitable, then you made some good money and then you can turn around and buy more, right? Then you want to turn around and buy that 30 to 45 days worth, like I said. All right, guys, so next we're going to go over some uh, uh, some about just shipping and logistics, right? Because this is a key part of the Amazon business, especially when it comes to the wholesale business model, when you're doing huge volumes and lots and lots and lots of products. So, guys, like I said at the beginning of this presentation, right, and that's pretty much the whole premise of my business model is that we are fully remote. We haven't seen or touched a product in close to three years. All right. You might be asking, how are we able to do this? How are we able to be fully remote? How do we never see products? How do we never touch products? Yet we're selling multiple millions of dollars worth of products per year. All right. And that is because we use prep centers. So for those of you that don't know what a prep center is, think of a prep center as an outsourced warehouse. Okay. So I used to have a warehouse. We had a 2000 square foot warehouse in Wake Forest, North Carolina, where when we bought from suppliers, our suppliers shipped to our warehouse. I sat there in the warehouse and I slapped a label on every product. I put those products in boxes. I put those boxes on pallets and then I wrapped those pallets up and I put those pallets on a truck and that truck took the pallet to Amazon. Okay. So as you can imagine, that whole process is very time consuming. 
ideally you want to have employees doing that. So that's expensive. You got to pay their salaries. You got to pay for their insurance. You got to pay for materials. You got to pay for the warehouse. There's a lot of expenses that go into having your own warehouse. So one day I decided I don't like doing this, right? I don't like the warehouse aspect of this business. I don't like having to deal with it. I just would rather have, I would rather pay somebody else to do that for me. You see what I mean? So that's exactly what a prep center does. A prep center, you pay them per unit to handle all of that for you. All right. And ever since we started using a prep center, that is when we really started to scale. Okay. So that is how we're able to not touch products, not, you know, not see products. They pretty much handle that entire aspect of our business for us. Like I said, guys, Prep Center is essentially an outsourced warehouse. They will prep your products for you and they will send them to Amazon so you never have to touch them and you never have to see them. And the best part about this whole thing is some of our suppliers even ship straight to Amazon for us. Okay, so that's best case scenario. There are some suppliers out there where you don't even have to have them ship to your Prep Center. They will turn around and ship your product straight to Amazon for you. All right, so you... You save money by not having to ship to your prep center. You save time because your products get to Amazon quicker. That is the best case scenario. That is not necessarily something that you could expect as a beginner. That's something that comes with relationships, right? Some of our suppliers that are shipping straight to Amazon for us are suppliers that we've been working with for years. We've done a lot of business with them. We're comfortable with them. And they are willing to do that for us because we spend a lot of money with them and because the relationship is there. All right. So that, but that is what is possible with this business, especially once you get to scale. So when you're starting off, you're going to be shipping just boxes at a time to, via UPS to Amazon, right? I'm sure a lot of you are currently doing that, whether you're doing private label, whether you're doing retail arbitrage, online arbitrage, you're probably sending out individual boxes, a few boxes at a time to Amazon via UPS. And that's exactly how I started it. And that's how everybody starts, right? That's, that's the way you have to start. Eventually, you'll be shipping out pallets, right? Which in this picture right here, all of you probably know what a pallet is, but that is just a bunch of boxes stacked on a pallet wrapped up that you can send kind of in bulk, right? That's kind of the next step up. You're sending a lot more products at a time. Excuse me, guys. All right, so guys, that is pretty much the gist of shipping and logistics, right? I didn't go super deep into detail there only because like I said, all of our shipping, all of our logistics are handled by the prep center. They do it for us. We don't have to touch products. We don't have to see products. That is how I prefer it. And that is really what has helped us scale a lot quicker by because we're now able to double down on sourcing and doubling down on what we are good at, which is creating relationships with these suppliers. <clears throat> All right, guys, so now we're going to touch on exactly how I use virtual talent to scale. All right, so that's something I mentioned earlier in the presentation. This is not necessarily a beginner method. This is something that as you start to make money, as you start to grow your business, it makes sense to bring on virtual employees, either from the Philippines, from India, from Pakistan, some basically countries where the cost of labor is a little lower than the cost of labor might be in the States or in the UK to really help you scale your business quicker right? Because there's some really smart people in those countries and the dollar, because I'm in the US, a dollar in those countries goes a lot farther than a dollar does here. So you're able to hire really talented people for a lower price. Okay. So that's what I mean when I say virtual talent. So you might've, a lot of you might've heard the term VA, right? Or virtual assistant. And you might not know what that means, but I pretty much explained it. A virtual assistant is basically somebody that lives in another country or not even necessarily in another country, but just, they don't live near you, right? They're virtual. They're not with you. And typically it refers to people, like I said, in those lower cost of labor countries where the dollar goes a lot farther and they do good work. They're hardworking people. They're great communicators. They're really, really good people and they're willing to work for your business for a lower rate. And guys, <laughs> I'll be honest, VAs run my entire life, okay? They don't they not only run my business, they run 90 to 95% of my business. They also run my personal life. So I have an assistant, she lives in Nigeria. She runs she filters my email, she filters my she runs my calendar, she runs my schedule. 
She books my travel. She orders my personal things for me on Amazon. She literally does everything for me, all right? She is a VA just like my employees and my business are VAs. They do everything for me. Everything that I could possibly hand off to a VA, I have handed off to a VA, all right? Because like I said, the labor is cheaper, they're hard workers, and they do the stuff that at the end of the day, I don't personally want to do. Like I said, guys, they handle about 90% of the tasks within our business, and they're really good people, and they're really smart, and they're really, really hardworking. And so some of you might be thinking, well, hey, where do I find these VAs? They sound fantastic. So if you're starting off, I would not recommend you start off with the VA, okay? This is an advanced tactic. This is for somebody that has knows the foundation of their business. They've learned the ropes. They are, you know, they're starting to scale. They're making money and they're trying to take their business to the next level. That is what a VA is for, right? And so when it comes to finding these VAs, I like to find them. My personal favorite place is finding them on onlinejobs.ph. All right. So onlinejobs.ph is a Philippine specific job board for Filipino VAs. So my current two employees, they live in the Philippines. This is where I found them, onlinejobs.ph. And Upwork is another really good option, okay? So Upwork is gonna be better for, <clears throat> for like developer talent and for certain tasks, right? Upwork is good. It's gonna be a little more expensive, all right? A lot of people on Upwork are from the Middle East, which is great. Those are great people as well. But like I said, Upwork is gonna be slightly more expensive and you pay them through Upwork. So Upwork actually takes a large cut from your VA. So the VAs that I know don't necessarily like Upwork because Upwork takes a huge chunk of their money, okay? Another great platform for hiring VAs is Fiverr. Now, this is my one warning for Fiverr. So if you're looking for like a full-time or even a part-time employee to be dedicated to your business, I would not go to Fiverr, all right? Fiverr is gonna be best for one-off, freelance projects, stuff like logo design, website design, uh, just like, you know, one-off tasks with like a set start date and a set end date. That's, that's where you're going to find really good people on Fiverr. Okay. Fiverr is not good for somebody that you want to have in your business all day, every day. And guys, when it comes to my virtual team, so really we do a couple of different things to manage them effectively. So we use Slack to communicate. And for those of you that don't know what Slack is, it is a just a like a, essentially like a WhatsApp, right? It's just a communication messaging tool. So we're communicating all day via Slack. And then my VAs will send me a check-in message each morning when they begin work. So I know when they started. They'll send me a check-out message every night. So I know when they're done. And they will also summarize. So during their checkout message, they summarize what they accomplished for that day. So not only do I know when they're done, so I don't bother them after they're done, they will summarize everything that they did that day so that I can very easily tell, okay, this is exactly what happened today, right? So I'm not guessing as to, hey, did this get done? Did that get done? I can see it right there in black and white. And the other good thing about Slack is it allows us to send video and voice messages as needed. So if we're working on something and let's just say I'm working on a task or they're working on a task and they need my input, then they can send me a quick video message or even a quick voice message, and we can communicate a lot quicker, a lot easier via Slack. All right, so that's how really we, we kind of structure our communication and keep everybody on the same page. And another big key to our success, guys, is we hold a weekly accountability call every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. for an hour, and it keeps everybody on the same page. So what we do in that accountability call is we go over our KPIs, which are our key performance indicators. They are basically uh, the, the main metrics that we're tracking in our business to make sure that we're on the right track and to make sure that we're growing. All right, the other thing that we do is we go over any issues that we're facing. We go over any purchase orders that we're working on. Really that weekly accountability meeting is to keep everybody on the same page and make sure that we are moving our business forward together. All right, and guys, here are some miscellaneous points that I want you to consider that didn't really fit into any of the other categories, but I wanted to make sure that I mentioned during this presentation because they're important and I think they will help you guys even if you're beginners or even if you're advanced. But before we get into the miscellaneous points, let's take a couple more questions. So I'm gonna take a quick peek at the questions that have been asked and see if I can answer some of those before we get into this part of the presentation. 
Uh, so somebody said, is that called Slack? So yes, the, the messaging app that we use is called Slack, S-L-A-C-K. It's free and it is a really, really good communication tool. All right, so Jamie said, what if you had the capital to hire a VA now to assist with the supplier prospecting, finding product, et cetera? Could the downfall be not being able to train the VA effectively? <clears throat> so Jamie, exactly. So that is exactly why I don't recommend somebody that's newer to this business model start with a VA. Because if you don't know how to do a task, how could you expect a VA to do the task well, right? So me personally, I learned every aspect of the business inside and out through and through before I ever hired a VA. Because the way I saw it is if I hire a VA before I know how to do a task, how am I going to know if they're doing it right? You see what I mean? And I know there's some VAs in this chat here, so this is no offense to any of the VAs. There are so many good ones out there, but there are some some unscrupulous VAs out there that will take advantage of people like you, Jamie. And again, this is no offense to you, Jamie, but to people that are newer in the space, they might see them as easy targets. They might you know, say that they can do one thing and actually not do it. There, there can just be a lot of shenanigans that go on with VAs when it comes to maybe some more inexperienced wholesalers. So that is why I recommend not starting off with a VA until you are a little more advanced and until you know exactly what it is that you need them to do. So Stephanie said about the methods for payment, you consider certain bank accounts better than others. So Stephanie, I don't know if you're referring to like paying suppliers. Um, if you're referring to paying suppliers and it doesn't really matter what bank account you have, uh, typically we pay all of our suppliers with a credit card. So the bank account really never comes into play. I mean, as long as you're banking with a reputable bank, then you shouldn't have an issue with any sort of payment, anything. So somebody asked, can you tell us how to get ungated in pet food? So pet food is really, you, ungating is not an issue at all, right? You can get ungated in any category just from a retail receipt. So if you buy 10 units of a pet food product from Target and submit that receipt, even the Target receipt will get you ungated. Uh, so somebody, Sandy asked, is Amazon still restricting a max of 200 units at a time to the warehouse? So no, they are not. That is something that they did during COVID. That is not. That is no longer a restriction. There are quantity limits in place, but they are not an issue for me. And from what I understand, even for newer sellers, the quantity limits that you will have are really high. You you really should not ever run up against your your quantity limits. Okay, so that's no longer an issue. So somebody asked, how to, how do I find prep centers? So there are a million prep centers out there right? Prep centers are a dime a dozen. Unfortunately, about 95% of prep centers are garbage, right? They're just not good. They are unprofessional. They don't communicate well. So there's just a lot of bad ones out there. <clears throat> so when it comes to finding a good prep center, my friend, his name is Chris Grant. He has a website called cleartheshelf.com. If you just Google search clear the shelf prep center, he has a really, really good list of approved prep centers on his website not necessarily approved, but more so prep centers that he vouches for as being legitimate, right? So if I were you and I was looking for a prep center, I would look at prep centers on that list and I would look to reach out to a prep center on that list at cleartheshelf.com. Uh, so Jamie asked, is the buy box evenly dispersed by the seller? So no, it's not, Jamie. So there's a lot of factors that go into who gets the buy box and who doesn't. One of those factors is, you know, you're, you've got to be FBA, right? So if you're an FBA seller, you're going to have a much higher chance of getting the buy box as opposed to FBM. If you're the lowest price, that's going to be a big factor in helping you get the buy box as well. There are also a lot of other factors to consider when it comes to getting the buy box, but really those are the top two main ones at the end of the day. All right, so there's some really good questions, guys. Now let's jump back into the presentation here. All right. So like I said, here's some miscellaneous points that I want you guys to keep in mind that I think can help you out on your Amazon selling journey that didn't quite fit into one of the other categories nicely. So we're going to touch on them now. All right. So one of them guys is, so when we buy inventory, we buy all of our inventory on credit cards. Okay. We never pay cash for anything. We always pay with a credit card and we, I prefer to pay using a cash back credit card. So my favorite credit card to use 
is the Capital One Spark, which is unlimited 2% cash back, okay? So guys, in 2022, last year, I personally pocketed over $30,000 just in cash back from our credit cards, all right? So, I mean, we're spending a few hundred thousand dollars per month on inventory, and that, like I said, gives us, I mean, thousands and thousands of dollars in cash back every month. So really, I see cash back as almost like my bonus. So whenever I get a cash back check, I pretty much just put it into my personal account. All right. So that's not tax advice. That's not financial advice. But like I said, I treat it as a bonus to myself. And once you start to scale a wholesale business, the cash back and the credit card points that you're getting from your credit cards from buying inventory really add up and can be an entirely separate source of income for you as the business owner. And this is another big perk of being in the business for a long time. So these days, guys, 90% of the products that we're buying are inbound leads to us. Like our suppliers are sending us those leads. Okay. So for the first four years, <clears throat> everything that we were buying, we were having to grind for, we were having to find in the supplier's catalog, get a quote for like really just scrap to find these good products. But now, part of this is because I've gotten a lot more active on social media and really putting myself out there on social media. So nowadays, suppliers are finding me, they're sending me leads, and a lot of our products are inbound. So we're not really having to do as much work to go out and find profitable products. They're coming to us, either from our existing suppliers, from other sellers that want to do deals with us. A lot of our leads are inbound. And like I said, a lot of that is because I'm putting myself out there on social media. And just because we've been in the business for a while, we have a good reputation and we do good business with good people. All right. So you can get to that point. You can get there sooner than we did. If you really get active on social media, if you really network with a lot of people in the space, you can start having a lot of those inbound leads coming to you. So you're not having to go out and find a lot of those leads. And guys, another thing that comes with being in the business for a little while, right? For, like I said, four and a half years of wholesale is our existing VAs are training any of our new VAs. So if we were to bring on a new VA today, yes, I would interview them. I would obviously make sure that they're a good candidate. I would make sure they're a good fit. But when it comes to onboarding them and getting them up to speed in our company, that is something that my existing VAs will do for me, right? Because my existing VAs, know the business inside and out. They know exactly what to do. They know exactly how everything works. So they can very effectively train new VAs on exactly how to do their role. All right. So when we bring on new employees, a lot, I mean, I'm checking in, obviously I'm checking progress, but a lot of the training aspect of it is hands off for me and is accomplished by our existing VAs. So that's a big perk that comes with experience, with being in this business for a while and having a really strong virtual team. Now, guys, this last tip I'm going to give you here is was a game changer for me. OK, so this tip is one that takes less than four minutes to set up. And this tip is going to increase your sales by 10 percent overnight. If you are an online arbitrage seller, if you're a retail arbitrage seller and if you are a wholesale seller. OK, and that is called the catch all PPC campaign. All right. Basically, what it involves is setting up an a automatic PPC campaign on your account. You add all of the products in your inventory to the campaign. You set your bid at five cents and you set your daily budget at $50. Okay, that is it. And then you press go. It takes less than four minutes to set up. And now you might be thinking, well, $50, I don't want to spend $50 per day on ads. You won't, right? That's the beauty of this campaign is you will never even get close to spending that $50 per day. You might spend, you know, five, seven, $10 per day. But the beauty of this campaign is since your bid is set so low, your bid is set at five cents, you're basically paying five cents per click so that when those clicks generate sales, your return on your ad spend is massive. So for example, our campaign, I believe off the top of my head, our return on ad spend for that campaign is something like 39 to one, which means that for every $1 we're spending on advertising, we're generating $39 in revenue, okay? From this one campaign that took four minutes to set up, all right? So this is something that I have a screenshot somewhere, I, I wish I could find it, where 
we had this exact same campaign running. It's been running since September of 2020. We have not touched it. We have not turned it off. We have not done anything to it except add all of our new products to it. It has generated over, I think it's $260,000 in revenue from that one campaign on like 12, it was something like 12 or $14,000 in advertising spend. Okay, so the return on the ad spend is massive. It's literally free money. It's the closest thing you could possibly get to free money on Amazon. And like I said, it takes less than four minutes to set up. And it consistently month after month after month increases our sales by an average of about 10%, okay? And now guys, this is not some like black hat technique. This is literally just like an advertising campaign that you set up on Amazon. And guys, I mean, I, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you taking the time to pay attention. And that is it guys.